You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. I'm Jeremy Dontremont, historian for the Society. Welcome. Today is June 4th, 2024, and this is the third episode of Lighthearted Light. That's Lighthearted, L-I-T-E. In this special series, we present past interviews from the five years of Lighthearted, edited down to around 15 or 20 minutes. I know some people enjoy the longer interviews, but this is an opportunity for people who don't have so much time. Today we're going to listen to a conversation with the maritime historian Eric J. Dolan, first presented in episode 26 in September 2019. Eric has written 14 books and dozens of articles on American history. His latest book is Left for Dead, which tells the true story of five castaways abandoned on the Falkland Islands during the War of 1812, a tale of treachery, shipwreck, isolation, and the desperate struggle for survival. The book discussed in this interview is Brilliant Beacons, A History of the American Lighthouse, which was published in 2016. C. Douglas Kroll wrote in Sea History magazine that Brilliant Beacons is, quote, a must-read for anyone interested in lighthouses or America's maritime history. This history of American lighthouses is both engaging and enjoyable, whether for academics who will not be disappointed in the thoroughness of the author's research, or for lighthouse history buffs who will enjoy its compelling narrative." It was a real pleasure to chat with Eric at his home in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Let's listen to that conversation now. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today, Eric, and thank you for inviting me into your home. Uh, It's uh, an honor to be here in your inner sanctum, uh, your (laughs) bat cave. (laughs) Uh, It's a real honor, surrounded by your your books and some really interesting artworks and things here. So thank you so much, Eric. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me to do this. Uh, The books you've written uh, all fall under the broad heading of maritime history in some way, or at least uh, certainly touch on that aspect of history. Lighthouses would seem to be a natural subject for you, but I'm wondering if lighthouses were on your radar for long, and I'm wondering what led you to write the book, uh, Brilliant Beacons. Lighthouses were not on my radar at all. In fact, before I wrote this book, I had only seen a couple of lighthouses, and I really never thought about them much. And unlike uh, almost all of my other books, the topic for this one didn't originate with me. I just finished a book called When America First Met China about the China trade from the American Revolution through the Civil War and I was rooting around for another topic and I had a couple of ideas when all of a sudden my publisher uh, W.W. W. Norton contacted my agent and said, hey, we'd like Eric to write a book on lighthouses. What do you think? And I said, I'm not sure. Uh, since I knew so little about it, I couldn't answer right away. So I said, give me a month. And I went off and I read a ton of books about lighthouses, including some by you, Jeremy Dentremont, which uh, got me excited enough about the topic. I realized that there's a fascinating history about America's lighthouses, and it was much deeper and more complicated than I ever had expected. So that, that was the genesis of the book. I went back, I said, yeah, I'd love to write the book. And I wrote a proposal and then worked on the book for a couple of years and The book happened. (laughs) Uh It sure did. You did an amazing job. Lighthouses are phenomenally important. When you look at the broad history of America, the way that I look at it in, in, in effect is it's so much about commerce. It's so much about making money, especially American history. And if you follow the money and you follow the roots of commerce, you realize that we are still a maritime nation. The vast bulk of all of the goods that come into the United States and leave go via ocean routes. And that was certainly the case back during the great age of sail and even before. So without lighthouses, uh, our commercial history would have been dramatically different, much more deadly, much less successful, and I think, in fact, much less interesting because the lighthouses, uh, it's just, it was such a rich vein of history. I was a little embarrassed and amazed at how little I knew about lighthouses because I've read fairly broadly 
uh, in American history. So you literally cannot understand American history if you don't understand the role of lighthouses. Would you say there was much that surprised you? And what would what was the most surprising aspect of lighthouse history for you? Uh, the most surprising was the sheer number of lighthouses. If you had asked me before I started working on this book, how many lighthouses are, were there or are there in the United States, I would have said a couple of hundred. I didn't realize that it was perhaps around 1,500 or maybe even more. It's just absolutely amazing and that there are lighthouses in the Great Lakes. I never thought about that. So, And also the fact, another thing that really fascinated me were the role of lighthouse keepers, not just the men, but the women. Mm-hmm. And the fact that there are female lighthouse keepers, so many of them, and assistant lighthouse keepers, and uh, their role at a time when women barely worked outside of the house, much less having jobs that were so incredibly important. And uh, from what I read in the history, which was almost hard to believe, is that a lot of women lighthouse keepers were paid the same rate as their male counterparts, which is quite unusual during that uh, era. So there are so many things. Oh, to answer that question, it's almost every single page of the book has some piece of information on it that fascinated me. Like, I had no idea the lighthouses played a role in the American Revolution or that they played such a critical role in the Civil War. Absolutely. I just, it, it, was, it blew me away. In your book, you, uh, you detail the politics of uh, American lighthouse administration uh, through the first half of the 1800s during the period when Stephen Pleasanton uh, <laughs> was in charge of the Treasury Department and Winslow Lewis held a monopoly for providing the lighting equipment. Uh, despite the availability of the superior Fresnel lens Mm -hmm. uh, invented in France uh, just about 200 years ago. Then you uh, had the important report by Congress by Winslow Lewis's nephew, I.W.P. Lewis, Mm -hmm. and you wrote uh, about that in your book. It's a very dramatic and very fascinating story. Uh, Did you see it as a story of heroes and villains as you wrote about it? Uh, Any comment (laughs) on, on that whole thing? You couldn't help but see it in terms of heroes and villains, even though it's hard to vilify people when you understand the context of how they were operating and what the situation was that was facing them. But that tale of Winslow Lewis, of Pleasanton, of IWP, of all the congressmen who were involved, of the Lighthouse Board report in 1852, all of those things in the role of France and England and uh, Augustine Jean Fresnel, the Fresnel lens, just all of those stories. It was Shakespearean in terms of its scope. And Stephen Pleasanton, we only have one image of him, and he looks like a real sourpuss. He looks like Scrooge. He looks like Scrooge. (laughs) And he was in many senses. He was a real stick in the mud. He represented what I would consider to be the worst aspects of a bureaucrat. He didn't have an imagination. He didn't accept counterfacts to try to change his view. And he just went along this track and he dug in and tried to protect himself, Winslow Lewis, and the system that the two of them had cobbled together, despite the growing evidence that our system of lighthouses and especially the illumination, not to mention uh, the construction of the the towers themselves, were mediocre. And the fact that... uh, that Winslow Lewis's nephew, uh, IWP, is the one that launches the attack is just fascinating. But the villains were not only uh, Winslow Lewis and Stephen Pleasanton. They also were many congressmen who mm-hmm. failed to look at the plain facts and take responsibility for securing our maritime and commercial traffic, which is so increasingly important to America at the time. So it was a phenomenal story. In particular, what stories of lighthouse keepers really stood out for you (laughs) as you were writing the the book? Again, it's hard to pick favorites, but I'd have to put at the top of the list the one that most other lighthouse aficionados would also place there, and that's Ida Lewis. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ida Lewis's story, not only because the fact that she was a woman in what had tended to be a man's job for many years, But her personality and her intersection with the era of American history was just fascinating. Here's this woman, unassuming, wanted to do her job, took over for her dad, ultimately, and did all these rescues. And she was perfectly happy not to have any fame. But then in 1869, when the New York Tribune did this 
really dramatic story about some of her early rescues, she became one of the most famous people, not to mention women, in the United States. And having that fame thrust upon her and how she comported herself, which was in a very uh, professional and respectful manner, despite all of the people wanting to come into her life. At one point, 10,000 people visited Lime Rock Lighthouse during a summer just to catch a glimpse of Ida Lewis. They had July 4th was Ida Lewis Day one year in Newport. And she really was on the cusp of when American magazines and newspapers were really taking off. And they were looking for these exciting slice of life stories, larger than life stories. And, you know, England had Grace Darling. Now we had Ida Lewis. And she was one of the first people to be hounded by the paparazzi of the day. They came and they took, uh, you know, photogravures of her and Daguerreotypes, and they wanted a piece of her. I mean, Ulysses S. Grant came to Newport to visit her, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, a lot of famous people of the day, and I just think it was great that she stuck to her job. She didn't cash in on her fame. I'm not sure how she would have done it at that time. But uh, And up until the very end, the early 1900s, she was still saving people. Mm -hmm. And then when she died, she had a funeral worthy of a head of state. So I really loved her story, her heroism, but not only the heroism saving people from drowning, but how she comported herself in the face of a virtual media hurricane or storm. Uh, Another famous hero keeper that I really liked writing about was Marcus Hannah at the Cape Elizabeth Lighthouse. Not only was he a war hero during the Civil War, getting the Congressional Medal of Honor, but when he saved uh, two of the men on board the Australia that crashed into the rocks off of Cape Elizabeth Lighthouse during a massive snowstorm when he nearly froze to death himself, uh, and then he got the life-saving medal, as did Ida Lewis, for that. That was just a compelling, exciting, pulse-pounding story to recount. The story of Annie Bell Hobbs, the little girl on Boone Island Lighthouse who was pining for life on the mainland and writing a little story about it that appeared in uh, a a magazine at the time. That was a great story. The stories about the lonely lighthouse keepers, some of whom took their lives, some of whom went crazy. Uh, The Judson and Nigren at the Whale Whale Back Lighthouse. Alan, actually. Alan, yeah. yeah. You write so much about these people. You write a couple of years <laughs> yeah. ago. You forget I only know stuff. that because I talk about that story in my lectures all the okay. time. It's an incredible story. But, but that was, you know, these people going after each other and trying to kill each other, and then the the uh, the officials, the law enforcement uh, stepping in. That was an amazing story. Yes. Uh, almost every single lighthouse keeper I read about had a story worthy of telling, and perhaps that's why so many individual lighthouses have great books uh, about them. Mm-hmm. I loved. Uh, Emily Fish, Emily Maitland Fish, yes. at the Point Pinos Lighthouse, the socialite keeper, and her husband, Melanchthon, the doctor who died suddenly of a heart attack, left her with a lot of money, but she wasn't sure what she was going to do. And then all of a sudden, through her brother-in-law, she finds out about the keeper position, and she goes and becomes the keeper with her manservant, uh, Q, a Chinese gentleman that she got from when she was over in China. And she has these soirees out at the lighthouse, and she's got a little herd of black poodles that run around. (laughs) And then she lived through the 1906 earthquake, and that was a fascinating story. And then it's even neat that her daughter, Juliet Nichols, became a became a lighthouse uh, keeper as well at the Angel Island Lighthouse, right, in San Francisco. There are so many great stories about uh, lighthouse keepers. Uh, It was... It was really funny. You're right. The human stories are the ones that bring it, uh, bring it to life. Uh, the story is not only about hardships suffered, deaths that unfortunately occur, uh, like the keeper at uh, Cape, well, Cape Farrell. Well, he didn't die. The guy at Cape Farrell on Lighthouse who got so depressed he pitched himself off the, the, the cliffs and the other keepers went down and gathered him up and brought him to the mainland hospital where he survived but was ultimately fired by the lighthouse establishment. And then there's the very tragic story of Scotch Cap Lighthouse in Unimac yes. Island that is basically swept away with a 100-foot tsunami wave and the five keepers there who unfortunately lost their lives. So I can go on and on, but that's one of the things that is most compelling because at every single lighthouse... 
not only are there so many lighthouses, but every single lighthouse has multiple keepers, and each of them has a story that is fascinating for one reason or another. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Besides stories of lighthouse keeping, uh, probably the other biggest source of drama would be the stories of building some of these lighthouses, and you tell some of those stories in the, in the book as well. Yeah, mine it's Ledge Lighthouse, not only because it's uh, close to where I live in Marblehead, Massachusetts, relatively close, but it's such a dramatic story that plays out over a number of years. You have the first Minot's Ledge Lighthouse, which came into being an iron pile lighthouse in 1849. And then it only lasts for about two years. It gets knocked over by a nor'easter that came barreling down the coast. And two of the keepers, unfortunately, lost their lives. There's a very fitting monument to them in Cohasset that you can go visit. Uh, so that was dramatic enough that uh, there was this lighthouse built on a ledge that's out at sea about a mile. Most of the time is underwater. It was very difficult to build an iron pile lighthouse, but then it gets knocked over and they realize they need a lighthouse in this location to help people who are coming up from the south to go into Boston Harbor or leaving Boston Harbor and going south. So they decide to build another lighthouse and that tale, which played out over many years, finally finishing just as the Civil War was about to erupt, building this 114-foot solid granite block lighthouse is just an amazing tale at a time when they didn't have electricity, when they didn't have power tools. They had to transport these three to five ton blocks of granite a mile offshore, work mainly during low tide or extreme low tides, have to deal with the vicious and mighty Atlantic had to create sort of coffer dams, in a sense, around Minot's Ledge, the rock, Minot's Ledge, to keep it dry, to work on the lower courses of the lighthouse, and then building higher and higher and higher. Just amazing. And that lighthouse has withstood the worst that the Atlantic could give it for, uh, you know, 170 years. I don't know, a lot of years. <laughs> Go back to 18, 1860. Years, yeah. 160 years. And uh, just amazing, and the story about the I Love You light, of course, the uh, the flash of the the flash pattern of the Fresnel lens that is in uh, Minot's Ledge light uh, is just fascinating. And a lot of people, when I was giving talks on the book, a lot of people in different parts of the country had heard that story because there's something so human about it. Even though that the lighthouse establishment did not pick the flash pattern to. <laughs> to sort of impress some shoreside Romeo with it being an I love you lighthouse, you know, one, four, three. But it's a great story nevertheless. And of course, building Tillamook Lighthouse out off of mm -hmm. Oregon, building St. George's Reef yeah. Lighthouse off of California, the fact that that lighthouse, uh, both of them took lives, the fact that the St. George's Reef Lighthouse cost about $775,000 to build over the span of about a decade, the most expensive lighthouse ever built, and just the punishing conditions out on Tillamook Rock and on St. George's Reef and the fact that they were able to build these uh, very complex lighthouses from an engineering perspective. And then the lighthouses were such a great benefit to people traveling along the Pacific, which can often be as merciless as the Atlantic. So I thought that those were great stories as well. But almost, again, here, it's like every lighthouse keeper, almost every lighthouse to build it is an engineering feat. Mm -hmm. Building lighthouses on land that are near, uh, you know, dunes or uh, in tough locations is, is just as amazing. Building Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, uh, incredibly tall lighthouse with over a million bricks and then moving it at a later point back away from the shore, 1,500 feet inland. That was an amazing yes. feat of engineering. So, again, you, with lighthouses, you have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to information. Working on Brilliant Beacons served as an introduction to the world of lighthouse preservation for you. I'm absolutely amazed and totally impressed by the work that people have done to save and protect these historical icons, these sentinels of the coast. I visited a lot more lighthouses after I wrote the book than I did before I had written the book. And I was always incredibly impressed at the small and sometimes quite sizable museums that are associated with lighthouses, the very dedicated people who work there, volunteer their time, and also work at the lighthouses. I really was uh, blown away by the drive and determination of these people to not let an important part of our history go by the wayside. 
I'm fascinated by the people who have purchased lighthouses and turned them into bed and breakfasts, which enable them to not only make a living, but also to have people come stay at a lighthouse and really absorb in a very visceral way the history of that lighthouse. I have nothing but admiration for the people who have chosen to work on the preservation of lighthouses. Do you feel optimistic about the future of lighthouse preservation? I I am optimistic, but my optimism has clear limitations. Uh, There are far too many lighthouses for enough people and organizations to step forward to protect them all. So a lot of them, like the ones the Lighthouse Digest puts on the doomsday list, they are ultimately going to crumble away or something. They're they're just not going to become part of our cultural heritage in the way that you might like them to be. The ones that are more out of the way, yeah, they're the ones that are probably in the greatest danger of being left behind. But for lighthouses that are near major cities or are particularly iconic, I think the future looks very bright for organizations to step forward to take them over or for individuals who have deep pockets to purchase them. Thank you so much, Eric. It's really been an honor and a pleasure to uh, have a chance to talk with you in uh, your inner lair here, (laughs) the inner sanctum. Thank you so much. It's really been fun. Well, thank thank you. you, Jeremy. I really appreciate being asked. I enjoyed revisiting my talk with Eric J. Dolan. I hope you enjoyed it, too. We will be back with a regular episode of Lighthearted this Sunday. For now, thanks so much for listening, and keep a good light. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.